All right, everyone. Welcome back to the land of Kel. I am your host and the author. My name is Jeffrey Drum. Thank you all so much for joining me again. All right, everyone, welcome back. This is episode 86, and today I will be explaining my hypothesis for the function of a structure that is never mentioned in the conversation about ancient Egypt, Gizr el-Mudir, otherwise known as the Great Enclosure, an absolutely massive structure located just to the west of the Steppe Pyramid Complex in Saqqara. So if this is the type of content you're interested in regarding the function of the Egyptian pyramids, please subscribe to the Land of Chem here on YouTube, click that little notification bell, like, comment, and stay tuned if you want to help support the channel. Just check out thelandofchem.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at thelandofchem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's intro. So without further ado, let's get right to it. All right, everyone, here we go with tonight's episode. So to begin, here is a map of the area in Saqqara with the Steppe Pyramid here, the Pyramid of Wanis here, the Pyramid of Yusurkaf here, and the Pyramid of Teddy I here, all of which you have seen in my previous Sunday site visits. But today, I will be explaining my hypothesis on the function of this massive structure here to the west called Gizr el Mudir, or the Great Enclosure. And before we proceed, if you do some research into Gizr el Mudir, you will find some reports of the recent archaeological discoveries made in the area, but these are not from within or around the Great Enclosure. And here are some images of what was found during this archaeological excavation, and I will show you the exact location of this site in just a moment. So they found some statues and some miscellaneous artifacts, and they even found a sarcophagus in a 15 meter deep shaft that looks like this. And the burial inside the coffin was dated to around the fifth or sixth dynasty. And I will quote here from C News. Dr. Zahi Hawass, the director of the Egyptian excavation team, working with the Supreme Council of Antiquities at Gizr el Mudir Saqqara, announced on Thursday that the expedition has made a number of important archaeological discoveries dating to the 5th and 6th dynasties of the Old Kingdom. So remember, ladies and gentlemen, that the conventional story will tell you that the pyramids of the Giza Plateau, including the Great Pyramid, were built during the 4th dynasty and that within the few generations, the absolutely spectacular stonework that we see in those structures turned into this crudely chiseled out container. So they built the most exceptional monuments that have ever been conceived on this planet. And in a couple hundred years, the quality of the work went so far backwards that it resulted in what you can see here. I cannot disagree more with this timeline. What you can see here is absolutely the work of the dynastic Egyptian civilization, and it is a true burial site. However, the engineering and function of the Egyptian pyramids themselves is not. So the site that archaeologists are calling Gizr el Mudir is in fact not the great enclosure itself, and the excavation project is located here, just to the southwest of the Steppe Pyramid Complex. And this is an image of the site from the UK Times, and you can see the Steppe Pyramid quite close in the distance here. And here is another image showing the exact location of the excavation site here with the Steppe Pyramid Complex and the Pyramid of Winis over here and the actual structure called Gizr el Mudir, or the Great Enclosure, is over here. And I will quote this, the excavation at Gizr el Mudir are close to the nearby pyramids of Wanis and Djoser. To the west 
you can still see the outline of a mysterious structure that still puzzles Egyptologists to this day. So just keep in mind that if you see reports of discoveries from Gizr el-Mudir, it is not referring to any excavations within the enclosure. And they still have absolutely no idea what this immense structure was actually for. And this is because they are not thinking practically from the perspective of ancient chemistry. All right, everyone, just a quick reminder that if you want to help support the channel, just check out the landofchem.com. I have some fire Land of Chem merch, hoodies, long sleeve shirts, t-shirts, the new six degree logo, the green lion will be released soon. Digital copies of the book are still available. Reprints and extremely rare signed copies of the book will also be available on my website very soon, and I'll be making a formal announcement here. Just stay tuned. But for now, if you want to help support the channel, just go to thelandofchem.com, and thank you all so much. All right, now, let's do exactly that. Think practically from the perspective of ancient chemistry, and I will propose my hypothesis for the function of this structure. So here is an image of the enclosure itself. And you can see the colossal size of this area compared to the entire step pyramid complex over here. And here is a close up image. And this will show you how thick the walls of the great enclosure truly are. This was a massively reinforced construction and the technical specifications are as follows from an article on ancient Egypt sites. Gizr el Mudir is an enigmatic structure, almost twice the size of the step pyramid enclosure, with massive stone cut walls, and it is thought to be even older than Djoser's complex, which is said to be the oldest stone built monument in Egypt. The enclosure of Gizr el Mudir measures approximately 650 by 350 meters, and its walls are a massive 15 meters wide at their base. The walls have been excavated to a height of 15 meters. And by using the word excavated here, they are implying that they went down and removed material. And I am proposing that the interior of the great enclosure is below ground level, making it the absolutely perfect configuration. But their width suggests that they were originally much higher than 15 meters. The 15 courses of masonry uncovered consist of a skin of limestone blocks with a fill of rubble and solid rough cut stonework at the corners. The enclosure wall seems to have been completed and no trace of a structure has been found inside the walls, which rules out the possibility of a pyramid, and so its purpose is still unknown. So why did they build the walls that thick and so high? Well, one of the most basic questions regarding this ancient civilization has always been, how did they supply drinking water? Surely they weren't drinking straight up river water, and they definitely can't be using that water source directly for chemical reactions. So ladies and gentlemen, my hypothesis is that the great enclosure, Gizr el Mudir, is a giant reservoir with massively reinforced retaining walls for water treatment. And of course, it is one of the oldest structures ever built in Egypt because your people cannot farm or build homes or design huge chemical reaction facilities unless the first thing that they have is clean drinking water. And now, let's go to the historical record and see what it says about ancient drinking water. And I will quote here from the University of Wisconsin-Madison website section on ancient engineering technologies. The earliest documentation of water treatment was found in Sanskrit writings and inscriptions and in Egyptian tomb, which date back to about the 15th century BC. According to the archeological findings, Many different water treatment methods are mentioned in the Sanskrit medical writings known as the Susuruda Samhita. These methods include the boiling of water over the fire, heating of water under the sun, 
dipping of heated iron into the water, filtration through gravel and sand, as well as the use of the strychnose potteratum seed and a stone called gometica to disinfect water. Many ancient people from different cultures would use copper, iron, or hot sand in conjunction with boiling it. They also state that in ancient Egypt, aluminum sulfate, iron sulfate, or a mix of the two was used to remove suspended solids. Okay, so now we are talking chemistry for water purification. And this is all great on a small scale, but what about on a large scale for your entire population? So this, ladies and gentlemen, is why they built the Great Enclosure. For water treatment and purification on a very large scale. And here is an overview of how I am proposing this system worked. The Nile River flooding would bring water up to this area right here on the threshold of the valley temples as we have discussed before. And the streams leading off of the Nile River that you can see here brought water directly toward the Gizr El Mudir Reservoir. And I've highlighted the stream beds here, which you can still see quite well on Google Earth. And there is one that leads directly to where the enclosure was constructed, bringing water directly into the reservoir for treatment. And you can see here that there was an opening leading into the enclosure that would have allowed water to flow into the below ground level facility. And the flow of water would have been controlled by a series of sluice gates and a water lock system that allowed water into the enclosure when needed and also contained the water within the reservoir while it was being treated. So now back to the chemistry and the science of water purification. And I introduced and teased today's episode way back in episode 46 from almost a year ago when I was writing about the great enclosure Gizr El Mudir in the second book of the Land of Chem series. And yes, ladies and gentlemen, I have things written in the second book about sites and structures that I have not ever mentioned yet here on the channel. And I've started introducing some of them recently. So the first book was intended, just like the title says, as an initiation into ancient chemistry. And the second book is where all of the pieces will finally come together. So this is just a small preview of what you can expect moving forward, which brings me to ferric chloride, another chemical that was being manufactured by this ancient civilization. In addition to the aluminum and ferrous sulfate mentioned previously, for water treatment. And just remember what this yellowish substance here looks like, because you will see this again very soon. So what is ferric chloride and how is it used? And I will quote here from the website SPG Global, ferric chloride in the chemical economics handbook. The primary use of ferric chloride is to remove impurities in water and for wastewater treatment. Ferric chloride is also one of the few water treatment chemicals that can sequester odors. Combined with the use in industrial water applications and in the pretreatment of seawater prior to desalination, total water treatment accounts for more than three fourths of the total demand globally. Smaller volumes of high grade ferric chloride are also used as a catalyst in chemical reactions and as an etchant in microelectronics production. So just as we have today, there would have been a huge demand in the ancient time for chemicals like ferric chloride. And it also has interesting applications as a catalyst material. Very interesting, moving on. Next, from AltairChemica.com, ferrous chloride is produced by reaction of the synthesis hydrochloric acid and ferrous oxide, while ferric chloride is produced by the chlorination of ferrous chloride. Both products are available in the technical or drinking water treatment grade. The drinking water treatment grade is divided depending on the application in the standard or extreme grade. 
ferric chloride at 40% is widely used in the purification of drinking water, in the treatment of wastewater or industrial water. Ferrous chloride at 30% performs, among others, a function of control and abatement of hydrogen sulfide, the reduction of phosphorus, chromates, and the elimination of cyanides in the water to be purified. Hmm, ferrous oxide, you say, otherwise known as iron oxide. Do any of you recall hearing about iron oxide before here on this channel? Okay, now I think I have your attention. Again, a simplified method for producing ferric chloride. Solutions of ferric chloride are prepared by dissolving an iron oxide or carbonate or metallic iron in hydrochloric acid. Okay, so iron oxide and hydrochloric acid, you say? Well, where could we possibly find those two things? How about here? The Central Pyramid of Giza. The structure that I have proposed was producing hydrochloric acid and the massive deposits of iron oxide sitting right out front. And the puzzle pieces are falling into place slowly but surely. But how does ferric chloride actually work? Well, it is a coagulant in a process called flocculation. And I will quote here from sciencedirect.com. Flocculation is a process by which a chemical coagulant added to the water acts to facilitate bonding between particles, creating larger aggregates which are easier to separate. This method is widely used in water treatment plants. And this is what the process looks like, where the application of the coagulant allows the solids to accumulate, leaving the precipitated flocculant to settle at the bottom. And for those of you that are into the ancient alchemical process, recall the phrase solve et coagula, which means to dissolve and coagulate. So this process of coagulation was a part of the ancient chemical knowledge possessed by this civilization. And along with other materials like activated carbon, this ancient chemistry would have found its most basic application in the treatment and cleaning of water. Within the great enclosure or reservoir at Gizr el Mudir. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is how you think practically about the function of these structures from the perspective of ancient chemistry. And there will be a part two on the function of Gizr el Mudir discussing details like how the water was removed from the system and then distributed, and inshallah, God willing, an exclusive on-site expedition to the site coming up very soon. So please subscribe and stay tuned. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. This was episode 86, Ancient Water Treatment, The Great Enclosure, Gizr El Mudir. I really hope you enjoyed today's video. And in the next episode in the series, I went back to Saqqara to do a two-part investigation and a comparative analysis between the Pyramid of Winis and the Pyramid of Teddy I. Both of those Sunday site visits will be debuting next week, so please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube. Click that little notification bell. Like, comment, and stay tuned if you want to help support the channel. TheLandofChem.com. If you want to follow me on Instagram, my handle is at TheLandofChem. Ladies and gentlemen, I think that is it for today's video, so I will see you next time. Yo, are you still watching this? Please subscribe to The Land of Chem here on YouTube and click that little notification button. New videos coming out every single week. And check out this other episode. Come on, do it. Do it now.